Welcome to Working for Women, the independent women's forum podcast, where we are changing the conversation about women and public policy for the better. Welcome to IWF's latest Working for Women podcast. I'm Charlotte Hayes, IWF's Director of Cultural Programs, and I'm here this morning with IWF Managing Director Carrie Lucas. We're going to talk about the panel IWF is putting on in a few days, January the 11th to be precise, on the paid family and medical leave policy that the D.C. City Council has just voted to adopt, and why this policy, which sounds like a really good thing, might not be such a good thing. One of our panelists, who's a fourth-generation small business owner, told us that this policy could force small businesses such as his to fold their tents and leave the district. Um, But I'm really getting ahead of myself. Carrie, could you just basically tell us what the D.C. paid leave bill says? Sure, Charlotte, and yeah, thanks so much. It is one of those issues that on first blush it sounds like such a wonderful thing. Who doesn't want people who have a new baby or have uh, face a major illness to have time off from work when and still receive some pay? Um, but actually this has really serious consequences. What the district is proposing is to give all workers, whether they're full-time or part-time, um, in, uh, who, and anyone who works in the district, so that doesn't mean you necessarily live in the district as long as you have a job there, but up to eight weeks for um, time off for, if you have a new baby, um, and uh, up to six weeks if you face an illness and there's, um, you're allowed to take it. Um, it doesn't have to be taken all at once. It can be taken um, uh, you know, an hour at a time or a day at a time. Um, which, of course, creates a lot of headaches for business. Um, you know, one of the major things is this would, of course, end up being quite expensive. Uh, the district anticipates having to raise $250 million. Um, and they would do this by raising taxes on businesses. Um, they'll do this through a pay- payroll tax, which is, uh, depends on, on, um, on uh, how much someone's paid is how much they, they lose from their, their paycheck or how much extra businesses have to cost. So it ends up being quite a big burden on D.C. businesses. So, so you're right that there's a lot of businesses in D.C. who will be having to figure out um, what exactly makes sense for them for the future. Um, Carrie, I read an article uh, that quotes one of the supporters of this bill, uh, and she said something to the effect that, hey, just because a relative has cancer, you shouldn't be punished financially financially and I think that makes it sound like um, it's really inhumane to find fault with this paid leave bill how do you respond to that yeah you know it's it's one of those you're absolutely right because the benefits of such a bill are obvious and we all sympathize and everybody hates the idea of hearing that someone who's working hard and doing their best to get ahead and to keep their their family afloat um, faces is one of life's tragedies or an illness of their own um, or just a need to take time off from work and then faces financial hardship. Um, but the problem is, is that actually um, when it comes to, you have to focus on the other side too. Just looking at the benefits and who wins from a policy like this ignores the very real hardship that this bill can create. If business is in D.C., it costs too much for them to employ someone, um, they're going to end up reducing jobs. So you may find that that sympathetic person that we we don't want to have face your unpaid time from work is instead going to be jobless. Um, You know, that's not humane. That's not helping them. That's not compassionate. Um, So it's really important that we don't shy away from looking at both sides of the ledger. Yes, we can talk about the the benefits and the winners from a bill like this, um, but there's also real, real losers. Um, so um, we have to, yeah, we've got to be honest, it, it bothers me that so much of the media seems to ignore uh, problems, um, you know, the problems with skills like this and pretend that this is all upside when very few policies in life are all upside. Well, Carrie, let's talk about IWF's panel. For starters, who's on this panel? You know, we're gonna, it's such a great panel, Charlotte. I'm really excited about it. We're lucky to have Mark Friedman, who is Executive Director of Labor Law at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and Jim Dinegar, he's the CEO of the Greater Washington Board of Trade. They've been you know, fighting this battle and they've really been making the case um, in D.C. for why this will harm D.C. businesses and, and ultimately harm the people of the district. Um, but we also wanted to have a real-life perspective on what this bill can do to business owners who create the jobs that employ people. Um, so we have two, well, two small business owners. Scott Hoffman owns an insurance company that opened in 1906. And it's been in his family and running ever since. Um, Mr. Hoffman 
person is a kind of you know, civic minded small business man who, who is committed to the district. He wants to stay where his family business began. But as you mentioned in the opening, he can he, he warns that he can foresee um, having to relocate because of this paid leave bill. He, he basically points out that, that a, a policy like this is a red flag telling small businesses don't come to Washington. And another panelist is Ariane Bennett. Um, Ms. Bennett and her husband co-founded the Amsterdam Falafel Shop in the district. And you know, she, she actually you know, she favors some form of paid leave, but she worries that if employers are going to have to pay the full cost of this proposal, you know, the small businesses like hers are going to be hit very hard. And she told the Washington Post a, a quote that I thought was really kind of um, tells the story. As a small business, we have teeny, tiny, razor thin margins that we live with. And here's um, another almost 1% out the door. You know, the district needs businesses like these. We need them because they provide jobs and they contribute to the tax base, you know, not to mention providing services and products that, you know, enhance the quality of life in the district. You know, but this really should be a lively panel, and IWF's executive director, Sabrina Schaefer, which should be, should be moder- moderating. So I think it'll be a really great conversation. Um, Carrie, aren't you leaving out one very important panelist? <laughs> oh, I guess so. I'm going to be on the panel as well. Um, you know, because my husband is in the foreign service, I've lived in Europe for much of the past decade, and as, as most people know, countries in Europe have a lot of the po- kinds of policies and the paid leave benefits that the district is now considering adopting. So I'm going to be talking about how these, what I've seen and um, from how these policies are working out in Europe. So, Carrie, you've seen the future, or the future if we continue along this path. How does the future look? What are the pros and cons of the generous paid leave policies in, in European cities? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think you often hear, this is another one of those only looking at one side of the ledger. So often when you hear t- um, talk about the paid leave debate and um, you, you hear about how the U.S. is so far behind Europe that they make it sound as though um, the women in Eastern, particularly women in Western Europe, have just lived in a paradise of flexible work benefits and, um, and it's so wonderful. And, you know, there's an aspect of that. A lot of women I knew had babies and really enjoyed being able to take six months or nine months off um, and to still receive some pay from the government. But there's a big downside to that. Um, a lot of these women um, you know, had trouble finding jobs. Uh, they felt as though their employment opportunities were, um, were limited. Some didn't want to take all that time off and felt kind of burdened by it. Um, and then there was, you, you look at some of the numbers and the statistics bear this out. Women is kind of a, a hidden secret. Women in Western Europe are much less likely to be managers and professionals in companies, private companies, um, than women here in the United States. And part of that is certainly because of, of the cost of paid leave. Um, you know, one thing, as you know, Charlotte, I'm involved in, in kind of the day-to-day management of IWF, and I have to look at the numbers and figure out how, um, you know, how what our budget is and how many people we can afford to engage and to, uh, to hire uh, to work at IWF. And, you know, uh, like a lot of small small, small employers, um, you know, this, would, this could impose a real burden. I would be saying, you know, gosh, if somebody's going to disappear for, um, for eight, eight weeks at a time every year, um, you know, maybe we need to continue outsourcing that position. Um, there's some business that's not being cold-hearted. It's because of, of the financial aspects of this. And that's, you know, that happens in Europe. A lot of people look at women and say, gosh, she's 30 years old and just got married. She's probably going to go off and have a bunch of babies and not be very reliable for the next five years. Um, you know, that's, that can be a real, um, that's can be a real drag on women's um, opportunities and their upward mobility. So it's, it's really something that Americans should be aware of. Carrie, uh, how does the, the, the district paid family leave policy stack up with similar policies around the country? Well, you know, it's interesting because obviously, you know, the United States we haven't had um, you know, a many paid leave mandates. Um, just uh, California offers a, a, a relatively more modest paid leave program than what is going to be offered by the district. And they've just kind of started experimenting with similar, um, with similar packages in um, in major cities, from in California and in and in New York. Um, but this is, you know, this will be a, a, a really um, you know, interesting in some ways experiment to see how this goes, because the DC is really going into in- uncharted waters. And one thing that makes the this program so interesting is that as a lot of D.C. residents are kind of complaining about, you know, a lot of the people who will benefit from this policy don't even live in the district. Um, this is going to end up being a lot of D.C. businesses um, you know, who are going to be passing costs on to D.C. consumers 
uh, are going to be paying for benefits that are enjoyed by the residents in Maryland and in, um, in Northern Virginia, because that's where so many of the workers live. And I should mention, you know, another aspect of this, um, you know, this is going to be an incredibly complicated um, system. You know, we have the bill, the line read over the language of the, of the D.C. bill, um, and it leaves a lot. There are a lot of questions unanswered about how exactly this is going to work, um, but but it basically says the D.C. government is going to have to come up with an, in, um, an uh, administrative structure, basically create a whole new um, agency and bureaucracy to try to administer this incredibly complicated law. And it's also going to create credible, beyond the out-of-pocket costs of this thing, being hit with a new payroll tax, you're going to have to administer this thing. You know, this means that you're going to have to be trying to figure out schedules and know that your employees may disappear for the weeks at a time, um, or they may disappear for a few hours and say, hey, that was my unpaid leave. You know, I'm not just blowing off work. Um, it's going to make it really hard for businesses to manage their schedules um, and create a whole lot of new um, red tape and infrastructure that they need as well. So um, there's a lot to really think through, and I don't know that the, that the D.C. Council has thought through this, which is why I mean, we really need to, we need to talk about this and be careful. Um, you, Carrie, it looks like, though, that the district may very well be stuck with this policy uh, until it fails utterly, wreaking a lot of havoc in the meantime. But the city council has the votes to override a veto for, from our mayor, Muriel Bowser, who, by the way, has some reservations about the bill. Um, it would have to be approved by Congress, but uh, it does look like it, it has a very good chance of becoming a reality. So what do you hope to accomplish by putting on this panel? Well, you know, as you know, Charlotte, this, the, the, the topic of, of paid leave um, and the government kind of requiring uh, businesses to provide paid leave has been a topic of discussion. Um, we've been, you know, Hillary Clinton had talked about such a mandate as part of her um, presidential campaign. You regularly see proposals in Congress. And it's really a growing conversation around the country about creating this kind of mandate. I think this is a really important opportunity, uh, at least the district has been, um, been engaged in this debate, to make sure that people are hearing both sides of the story. So often the media is just focusing on this benefit and making it sound as though it's truly compassionate and really a no-brainer. But we wanted to try to raise the profile and make sure that people both in the district, but then we hope to attract the media so that they'll so that this will also spread down and people around the country will hear some of the arguments and some of the real-life consequences that businesses are considering as they stare into this, the creation of this new law. Um, it sounds like a great panel, Carrie. Uh, when is it, where is it, and how can I sign up? Okay, well, great. It's, it's Wednesday, January 11th, and it's, it's, it's here in Washington, D.C., where the famous Grover meeting is held. Um, it's right after the Grover meeting breaks up. It's um, at the headquarters of the Americans for Tax Reform, which is 722 12th Street Northwest on the sixth floor. We'll start at noon and continue until around 2 p.m. Um, you know, I, I, and you can sign up online, so um, please come visit us at IWF.org. Uh, but, Carrie, that's my lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know that's a big concern, so if we got you covered, um, IWF is going to be providing box lunches from Chick-fil-A. Um, okay, Carrie, I set you up really nicely for getting Chick-fil-A in. Um, but seriously, this is an important issue for anyone who cares about creating a thriving economy, uh, and I think it's likely to be one of the best discussions of the issue you, would he you will hear. Please go to our website, iwf.org. Please respond immediately. We want you to be there. And, Carrie, thank you so much for doing this podcast, and thank all of you out there for joining us for this Working for Women podcast. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, please give it a thumbs up, share it on social media, or stop by iwf.org for similar content.